Mike Browning, how's it going with you? And uh, your in your world, what's what's going on? <laughs> well, there's always a, a bunch of chaos. <laughs> Um, I just got through with some back surgery, that, uh, um, some laser spine surgery. It was the same place uh, that Pete from Morbid Angel uh, went through. We had real similar surgery. He had two spots in his back worked on, and I had two spots in my back worked on. Um, so I'm kind of recovering from that. This is, uh, you know, mine was from a car accident a couple of years ago with a massacre. Uh, so that, you know, it's only a 45-minute set, so I think I can pretty much get through that <laughs> so you think a drumming uh, you know extreme drumming creates sometimes problems like that well I think it, it definitely has the possibility to I mean there's so many different people that play different styles of drumming and you know some people don't move around a lot when they drum and some people do so I think that may have a possibility and it depends on how often you play too because I know in Pete's case you know, back in the early days, he used to work, you know, practice for like eight hours just on the drums every day, you know, and uh, he, he would treat it like a daytime regular job and go in there and just play all day. So I'm sure for his situation, it was probably, you know, just drumming that did it to his back. Do you keep uh, drumming, experimenting on drums all the time? Are you always working on drums? How's your schedule on drums? Well, um, lately it hasn't been as much as I'd like it to be. Uh, you know, I used to practice sometimes three, four days a week. Uh, uh, back in when I was in Nocturnus, we used to practice Monday through Friday, like, you know, religiously pretty much. And, you know, then it got a little bit less and less uh, three, four times a week, depending on how many projects I have going on. But right now, uh, lately, we've just been doing like one to two days a week as far as that. But I'm always doing other side projects with other types of things like keyboards and vocals and things like that. So musically, I'm staying busy, but not as much with the drums as I did before, which is probably why, you know, I don't have as many back problems stemming from the drums. Well, that could be a good thing then. Yeah, we're all getting older. A lot of us, you know, that have been around for a long time. I'm, I mean, I'm almost 50 years old. I'm 48. So, you know, it's hard to be playing that intensity stuff, you know, for hours a day. You know, it's going to definitely take a toll on you one way or the other if you do that. So I'm trying to cut back and not play as much as I used to so I don't hurt myself trying to play all the time. Now, now let's say when you look at, you know, people in this genre of music that play incredibly fast, let's say every album they get faster and faster. Is there going to be a time that it's just going to stop? Well, yeah, I mean, humanly, it's only possible to go to a certain speed, you know. And, you know, like, especially when you're talking about drums, um, you know, there's you can only lift the drumstick up so high to hit the next beat. So, you know, as far as that goes, it's 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 you know you can only you're pretty limited to as far as fast as somebody can go. You know what I mean? I mean it's pr still pretty fast. Don't get me wrong. You know, and and but the thing is, it's you know there is a limit to what a human can do. You know, I think. And once once that is reached, and then pretty much it's just going to be everybody you know trying to keep up with that. I think. You know, instead of like more of a competition. And like, listen, when you take a, yourself as a drummer, when did you first discover you could play fast, and how did you discover it? Um, I don't know if it was. I guess I've always liked to play metal. You know, I mean, when I was in high school, I met Trey, and we started, you know, playing music together. <clears throat> but we started with, you know, of course, like everybody else usually does with cover tunes. And back then, you know, we all there was was like Judas Priest and. You know, stuff like that. We did, you know, Angel Witch, Judas Priest, you know, a little bit of Venom here and there. Um, and then we kind of started working on our own stuff. But back then, Morbid Angel wasn't really a fast band. But near the end, when I was in the band, you know, of, of when I was in the band, I would say like around 85, 1985, you know, we started kind of playing things a little faster and trying to get a little crazier with it, you know. So I think uh, it was probably, uh, with Trey and I probably started playing about 1982, and I would say maybe even the end of 1981. And then as we got, you know, more involved into doing a band, um, uh, around 85, we started kind of speeding the band up, you know, the songs in the band. And that was when, like, Slayer started releasing stuff and, you know, the band started speeding up all over the place. And you had, like, you know, metal became like thrash metal, you know. Mm -hmm. So 
So I think I think yeah, it was probably around 1985 uh, that we actually started to speed the songs up and speed parts up in the songs and things like that. And when you're looking at your timelines, you know, 1981's the you know start of Metallica, you know, when they first started going at it, you know, and then you know Slayer also in those days before their '83 album and Venom, of course, you know, '81 with their first album too. Yeah. And, and even uh, like you know, like Angel Witch, they weren't really a fast band, but you know, they they definitely had that evil sound to them. That that was one of my favorite bands back in, in the in the early '80s. You know, was was Angel Witch, and then you know, of course, I discovered Merciful Fate, and then it was pretty much that I knew exactly where the direction I wanted to go with music. <laughs> you know, Slayer and Merciful Fate and 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 Celtic Frost, those bands. You know, you know, when I heard that stuff, it was like, yeah, this is exactly the kind of thing I want to throw like all three of those bands together and make one band, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like what we did, you know? Now, Mike, do you still sign the copies of, uh, let's say, Morbid Angel's Abomination of Desolation, the 91 release CD? I'm sure you sign copies and fans recognize you throughout the world. Oh, yeah, yeah, I still see it around. You know, it's, uh, I see it, I, I believe that Earache is still selling it. Um, a few people told me they are still able to order the CD from, from Earache. So, I mean, from what I understood when they re-released it, you know, or, or actually did the real release of it through Earache, um, I believe that was around, what, 91 or something like that? And and um, they, they were supposed to only print 10,000 of them, and that was it. But I can guarantee you that there's more than 10,000 of those from Earache out there. So, so yeah, I mean, people are still buying them today. Uh, so I don't, I'm sure they've done more pressings than they were supposed to do. It was supposed to be a limited edition, one-time thing at 10000 And then it ends up being more than that. Yeah, and then you have all your copies, too. You know, like, you know, it came out on LP, you know, cassette, I guess. I don't know if I've ever seen a cassette of it. Um, but I, I know it was on, on LP and, and CD, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I've ever seen a copy of Abominations from Earache on, on, on a cassette. Daddy, I'm done. It should be on cassette, though, in 91. I mean, you'd imagine. Yeah, I, I, I would think so, but I don't think I've ever seen one, you know? So, I, I, yeah, I'd, I'd be, uh, yeah, I don't think I've ever seen one of those. But then, you know, there's a couple things that Earache released that, that, like, when they released Abominations, I didn't even know about it. I wasn't told that it was being released. A, a friend of mine, I, I pulled up to a gas station here in Tampa, and my friend was jamming on it in his car. And I said, wow, you got a copy of that? And he's like, yeah, I got the earache copy of it. And I'm like, what are you talking about, the earache copy? You know, he's like, and he showed me the cover. And I'm like, and I was still on earache at the time, you know. Mm -hmm. This was like in between the key and thresholds. And I'm sitting there looking at this thing going, wow, you know. <laughs> This came out on my own record label, and nobody even told me that it was coming out. So, <laughs> so it, was a, it was a pretty crazy thing when I saw that, you know, and I got kind of upset about the fact that I wasn't even told about it. And, you know, like, I wrote, I mean, I didn't get credit for it, but I wrote a lot of the lyrics on there. And, and Trey wrote, you know, it, it's about 50-50 on that album. And, you know, even what he wrote, I took it and arranged it all to fit in the songs, you know, because I was singing and playing the songs at the time. So when we came up with the songs, he would give me like a bunch of words. Same with Nocturnus, you know, Mike Davis. But, he, you know, I would get a bunch of words and I would always be the mm -hmm. arranger to put the words into the song, you know, into a song's pattern and into a song. So I, I never really got credit for a lot of things like that. But, you know, it, it is what it is, you know, so. <laughs> so, Mike, let's take a song like Angel of Disease. Lord of Fe All Fevers, and play there. Do you, do you get some royalties at all in the songs? No, the the only royalties I, I ever got as far as uh, from the songs was from one song, uh, Chapel of Ghouls. And uh, as far as I did get, like, some royalties from Abominations being released after I found that out, I called up Earache, and I talked to um, Gunter Ford, Morbid Angels manager, and they're like, Oh, you didn't know about that? You know, it's like, uh, yeah, I didn't know about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. But they gave me, like, since they said it was supposed to be 10,000 copies only, they gave me a, a certain percentage of money. I, I wasn't supposed to say, you know, exactly how much it was. And it wasn't really a lot, I can tell you right. that. Um, but 
they gave me X amount of dollars, and that was it. No more royalties, you know, from abominations. So that's why, you know, supposedly it was only supposed to be 10,000 copies so they could pay everybody. So Ira could pay everybody, you know, me and Trey. And and uh, I think, actually, they, um, Richard Brunel never got any money from that album at all. Hmm. It was just uh, me and Trey and, of course, David Vincent. And David Vincent didn't play or anything on it. He was just the person that we had signed the record label. You know, he had a record label called Goric Records. And we signed to his label and recorded. That was an album. Abominations is a full album. I know uh, on the Morbid Angel website they call it demos. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I have, you know, a copy of, you know, like the record contract that we signed. So we signed a real record contract for that when I was in Morbid Angel. We went up to North Carolina and recorded a full album with Brian Slagle. I mean, not Brian Slagle, but um, uh, uh, what's his name? Bill Matoyer, sorry. Bill Matoyer. Uh, was the engineer. You know who he is? No, actually, I don't. Uh, Bill Matoyer was like, he did most of the engineering and recording for most of the Metal Blade stuff. Okay. I, he did the first two Slayer albums. I believe he did the first Metallica record. He did all kinds of stuff like Flossum and Jessam back then. I mean, Lizzie Borden, all the bands that were on Metal Blade that recorded out there in California. Um, he did all the engineering for that stuff. So being that he did that, David Vincent hired him to do the Morbid Angel record. Mm -hmm. So David actually owned the tapes, you know, and he sold them to Earache. And then Earache put them out and just paid me and Trey and David. You know, he paid David supposedly X amount for the tapes and then paid Trey X amount and paid me X amount. And I got like a tenth of what they got, you know, cash wise. And and then, you know, they were supposed to stop production on it, and that was it. But I can, like I said before, pretty much, you know, I'm I'm quite sure there's more than ten thousand of those out there. And that could be a uh, one way of a record label being smart in that way to say there's ten thousand pressed, and you know, the rest is history. For what yeah, you're exactly. saying, you know. Yeah, and that was the way they were paid. You know, supposedly David. Me and Trey were all paid that way as far as that's it. That's all there's ever going to be. Here's your money. It's done, you know. So if, now if they printed more after that, you know, who knows? Uh, it's just like, you know, the Nocturnus stuff. When it all when the key got re-released, mm -hmm. you know, we never saw a penny from that, you know. So, I mean, it's just, you know, that's the way the labels are, you know. <laughs> you can ask just about any musician that's been on a label, and they'll tell you they have They all have horror stories. It's a big bad business when you look at it all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. And I think, you know, the karma of all that is probably what happened because of the Internet, you know, and that the labels are just all dead now, you know. I mean, mm. there's, there's so many big, big labels that just aren't making any money anymore, you know. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that – For so many years, they just ripped off the band so bad and just made so much money, you know, that it just like finally caught up with them. <laughs> so it's kind of like a karma thing to me. And and look, who who's the basis on uh, Abominations of Desolation? Like on Wikipedia, it's marking uh, John Ortega. Yeah, Ortega. It yeah. John, yeah, it is definitely John Ortega that played bass on on that album. He was the bass player, and after the album was recorded. David Vincent said, well, the bass playing was awful on the record. You need to get rid of this guy. I know this bass player named Sterling, you know, and I'll get him for your band. So we, we fired Johnny and got Sterling in the band, and we did like one show with Sterling. And then after that, the band split in half, basically. And Richard and Trey went up there and started jamming with, you know, David. And me and Sterling stayed down here and reformed his band, Incubus. Could it be a whole big plan David had uh, all along? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about that at this point. Um, I know, see, what happened was there was a guy that lived here in Tampa in the Brandon area. He was friends with, like, Nasty Savage, and everybody knew him. Uh, his name was Metal Mike, and he was a vocalist. And he moved from Brandon, I'd say, around, I don't know, maybe 1985. So... One day he called me up and said, hey, I'm in this band. 
uh, called Baron Cemetery. I'm a singer for this band, and the bass player has a record label, and he has a whole bunch of money backing him, and he's looking for a band to sign in, and I told him about you guys. So we actually sent him, you know, just like a home recording, and he signed us. So, but the, what I had heard was, you know, later on was that David had the band Baron Cemetery, and Mike, uh, that Metal Mike guy was singing, uh, David was playing bass, uh, Steve Shoemaker was playing guitar, you know, Skeletor mm-hmm. from Hallow's Eve. You, you know who that is? Uh, no, I actually don't. Well, well, the guy, the guitar player from Hallow's Eve, Skeletor. Okay. He was playing guitar, and Wayne Hartzell was playing drums. So, Steve Skeletor, he quit the band. So David was looking for a guitar player when he signed us. So when we went up to record, we recorded all the tracks, and then David sent everybody in the band home except for Trey for mixing. Right? He said, "Well, it'll, it'll save money. I'll send you guys back to Tampa." I'm going to keep Trey up here for another week, and we're going to mix the album. So we all went back to Tampa and left Trey up there. Well, in that week, David was trying and trying and trying to convince Trey to join his band. And he, he kept telling Trey, oh, this album sucks. Everybody sucks on it. You know, blah, blah, blah. You know, you need to join my band. And, and Trey, Trey, at that point, still didn't want to do it, you know. So he came back to Tampa. And when he came back to Tampa, he was kind of like a completely different person. And... After that, the band was just like never the same after we recorded that album, you know, and he was gone for a while. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, it was kind of weird. So I know something happened when he was up there for that extra week with David alone. And I know, found out later from Mike, the singer, was that, yeah, David was all over Trey. Oh, you got to quit Morbid Angel and join my band. I've got all this money and all this, you know, and that's what really happened. So when Trey came back here, he had that on his mind. Oh, man, you know, I've got all this stuff going on. I've got all this stuff going on that I could do. This guy's got a ton of money, you know. And then it came down to David going, well, this album just isn't good enough to release. You know, he told Trey that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was kind of like, like you said, it was kind of like a big plan. I guess once he realized how good of a guitar player Trey was, he was going to do anything he could to keep Trey, you know, and get him in his band. You know, right. So, but then me and Trey, you know, I don't know. You probably heard the story a million times, but I caught Trey with a girlfriend of mine, and I beat him up pretty bad, <laughs> and that was pretty much the end of me being in Morbid Angel. So Trey, the night that I beat Trey up, he came over to the rehearsal room that we had, took his stuff, and that was the last I was ever in Morbid Angel. <laughs> there and uh, Richard decided to go with him Mm -hmm. and you know at that point you know Sterling had already been in the band for a a couple of months and uh, just just a couple months though and you know Sterling's like well I'm gonna stay here in Tampa and you know we'll just get a guitar player and redo Incubus but that's the real story of what happened do you think if you would have stayed in Morbid Angel things would have uh, presented itself differently in the band's future oh oh for sure I mean I don't think you know, in some ways, you know, what they did with David made the band uh, probably more professional, I would say, and more, like, precise and faster. But it took away the soul that the band had, you know, because when I was in Morbid Angel, the only thing that mattered was, like, pleasing the Necronomicon gods and being an occult band, a real occult band, mm-hmm. because there weren't any, you know. I mean, everybody out there was just like, oh, yeah, yeah praise Satan, this and that, but they never did anything real. And in Morbid Angel, the things in some of our lyrics, we did, you know. And uh, we did rituals, you know, before we played most of the time. And, you know, it was real, you know. So, I mean, that's the thing that got lost when, you know, Morbid Angel split in half and Trey went up and joined with David. It became more of a, uh, I don't know, a corporation, I would say, you know. The real evil, a corporation. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that too. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. You know, if, if you want to look at it that way. But I think the band lost its soul at that point. You know, I mean, sure they got better players. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm, I don't have any problems saying that Pete's is just an amazing drummer. But uh, if anybody knows, Pete wasn't the drummer that replaced me. It was Wayne Hartzell. 
But mm. Wayne Hartzell wasn't able to keep up with what David wanted to do either. So they got rid of Wayne and got Pete. Because on the Die Kingdom Come demo, that little seven inch, that's Wayne Hartzell playing drums. So, you know, it, it's it's in history that there was another drummer between me and Pete. He said it was the guy that was in David's band. And is Wayne Hartzell uh, credited for this? Yeah, he's credited on, on Thy Kingdom Come. Yeah. Okay. In fact, there's some pictures of him, too, out there, you know, of, of them as a band. Richard, Trey, Wayne, and uh, David Vincent. And that would be 1987. You've uh, looked on the Wikipedia, let's say, for the Morbid Angel, you know, band members and stuff. Everything on that is uh, looking good to you, would you say, when you look at the classic days of Morbid Angel? I don't know. I really haven't looked at the Wikipedia page on there. I mean, I know even my Wikipedia page had some stuff that wasn't right. And, and uh, you know, said that, 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 you know, even my Wikipedia page said that said I was a museum curator and, and a, a teacher in Egyptology. And that's not true. I mean, I, I know a lot about Egyptology and I have a lot of books on it, but I've never taught classes on it. You know, I do discuss things with anybody that wants to, but as far as, you know, professionally, no, you know, and that was on Wikipedia too. So kind of like Wikipedia is that kind of thing that, you know, I really don't trust what's on there because I'd say 30% of everything on Wikipedia is probably false. And some of it can be, uh, you know, looked at good because if there are sources linked to it. I mean, I'm, like I said, only I would say only 30% of it, you know. I'm not saying even 50, you know. It's, it's maybe even smaller, maybe 20 to 30% of Wikipedia is probably false stuff. The most of the majority of stuff on there is good information. You know, but you can't trust all of it, that's for sure. It's not 100%. Now, Mike, uh, you're interested a lot in, you know, Egypt and stuff like that. Let's say the pyramids and stuff. I'm sure you watch a lot of documentaries on uh, these, oh, these yeah. things. What What do you think of the pyramids now, like uh, what they are? I've seen a documentary on what they are, like uh, generators of energy and stuff. I'm sure you've seen something like that. Um, oh, yeah, the, the fact that, you know, like they're on the meridian, you know, they're like, you know, like the Great Pyramid, the biggest one of them all is, is right on, you know, north, south, east and west where it all converges. Right. So, you know, technically they were built on a certain spot for a particular purpose. And also, if you notice, I don't know if you've watched anything on the uh, the um, the holes that are in the pyramid on the sides. Right, right. Yes. Uh, certain stars line up and shine light into those on certain nights. So, um, and, it, and it, actually the king's chamber has a very small opening uh, which goes right outside the pyramid. And on, on a certain night, the Sothis star, um, Sirius B, actually shines right inside and, and shines its starlight inside the king's chamber. And that was meant for the king to be able to travel, uh, his soul, to be able to travel through that um, through that opening straight up, you know, like through the beam of that starlight. But also when you look at it, there was never uh, no um, people, you know, buried or, you know, uh, presented dead in the pyramids, right? Because they never found anything like that? Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, you know, well, well, King Tut's chamber was there. Okay. In, in King Tut's pyramid. But, I mean, generally they were mainly used for ritual purposes. Uh, but the, the king and the queen were buried in, in that pyramid. Uh, so they were definitely used as, as, uh, as the end, ending result of burial chamber, but they were also a ritual chamber as well. So the documentaries I've seen, like, uh, let's say that they're energy conductors and stuff like that, you, you uh, don't think that or do you believe in, in that method sometimes? Well, I've seen a lot of things on pyramids themselves, like not even those in particular, but just the shape of a pyramid being a very good energy conductor. Um, so I, I do think that they are pretty much giant energy conductors that, that uh, you know, they, they work on ley lines and stuff like that with the earth. So, yeah, I do believe, I think it all ties in together. You have, you know, energy conductors, uh, certain spots, they were placed in certain areas for certain purposes, you know, so certain stars could line up perfectly inside, you know, and shine shine their 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 beam inside there, um, you know, it was used for ritual purposes. The, you know, the pyramid is just an amazing thing because it has so many different things that all, all and they're all pretty much, you know, 
uh, feasible things that could be true, you know, that, well, they are true, you know, mm -hmm. they were used for multi-purposes. What's the coincidence so, so I, that it would be there, you know, in the middle of the earth? Well, I mean, I have, I have seen some, you know, a lot of things on the pyramids that does say that they could be even a lot older than what they were saying, and maybe they weren't even built in that era. Mm -hmm. And and maybe possibly that when they were built, that there was jungles around them uh, from the rain erosion that was shown, um, that there was actually rain that happened back in that time when the pyramids were built that eroded some of the sides of the pyramid. Um, so it's um, those things are still up in question, you know. Uh, but it is possible that the pyramids are older than they think, and, you know, they could have been around even before, which I'm not sure about that. You know, that's not proven. But, you know, they do show some pretty well, uh, pretty good evidence of the rain erosion on the sides of them, showing that there was probably forest, like, like jungle, and a lot of rain that happened around that time, which, you know, doesn't happen over there now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the conditions could have been quite a bit different you know, 2,000 years ago or more, you know, 2,600 years ago, you know. So, I mean, you know, it's hard to tell, but it seems possible that, that you know, that, that the conditions of the weather, the, the, the terrain and stuff like that could have been different back then. Most likely it was. One last question in the, the ways of Egypt and stuff like that, then go back to, you know, your, your future and music and stuff. Library of sure. Alexandria. Do you, do you believe in that? Is it is it there somewhere, buried? Well, you know, I mean, the, here, here, the thing was that when the Romans took over, you know, like Egypt and Greece, they burnt all the libraries. And, and they, they, so... I do believe that there were several libraries like that in Egypt and in Greece and things like that, and that the Romans destroyed it all, the Christianity Romans, you know, um, because they wanted to erase any prior religion, therefore being able to set up their own religion that was undisputed. I mean, if you really look at it in, in reality terms, why does the Vatican have the biggest library in the world that is the heaviest guarded and that nobody can go in there. Mm. You know, libraries, to me, are supposed to be public, so people can gain information. That's what a library is for. So why would, you know, the Vatican have the largest library in the world? I mean, the shelving in, in the Vatican library stretches, you know, I mean, the size of it is massive. It would, if you laid it out straight, it would stretch for miles. And do you know, could you imagine how many books are in there that would just change history? Yeah, I can imagine. And and nobody can get into that library. It is heavily guarded. Only certain people are allowed in there. And, and why? If it's real history, why would the church, the Vatican, you know, hide that from people? So in a sense, this is bigger than the World Congress Library in the United States oh, of America? Oh, sure. It's, it's, it's much bigger. I have to look into that. I uh, didn't really realize that. Yes, yes, and you should definitely look into that and look into the fact that that they will not let anybody that's not involved in their own little circle, you know, get into that place for any reason whatsoever. In the future, we got new products coming out anytime soon? Um, yeah, definitely. Well, we, I don't know if you know we just released that one split on prosolytism. Um, it's a, it's a, it was supposed to be, be a split CD, but, um, I guess when they really started looking at the packaging and the way they wanted to do things, uh, both bands had like six songs and, uh, like five songs and a cover song. So instead of doing one CD, they decided to give each band their own CD and make the packaging just like really crazy. So, um, we just released that not too long ago. And um, right now we've got a quite, like, a, I don't know, about like five new songs we're working on. Mm -hmm. And um, we also have um, the label Iron Pegasus that we did Retronomicon on. They're doing a, a Venom tribute uh, album. It's going to be released uh, directly, directly to vinyl. And uh, they had asked us if 
we wanted to put a song on there. So I was kind of, you know, I asked Belial, one of our guitar players, um, you know, what song would you want to do, you know? And he, like, kind of looked at me and laughed. He goes, let's do At War With Satan. And I was like, I was like, you know what? I'd love to do that song. That is my favorite Venom song, too. That's what I told him. I said, man, that's my favorite Venom song, too. I would love to do that, but that's just insanity. He goes, well, why, why don't we do it? So I, I kind of said, well, you know, I mean, it's it's like 19 minutes long, you know. He goes, well, no, the extended version is 21 and a half minutes. I said, man, you are crazy. <laughs> but, I, you know, I contacted Iron Pegasus back, and I gave him the idea. I said, what would it be like? Would it be cool if we did, you know, the extended version of At War with Satan? And uh, the guy was like, sure, man, you know, why not? I'll give you one whole side of the vinyl. We'll put like five bands on the other side. And uh, so what we did was we took the original, uh, well, I should say the extended version, you know, that's got the extra intro in the beginning. We took that as a template, um, and I recorded uh, drums on top of the whole thing. You know, I, I pretty much played along with the drums, and um, Belial, um, he played all the guitar and bass right on top of the original guitar and bass. And then um, our keyboard player actually came up with keyboards for, like, the whole song, mm -hmm. almost. There's only just a few parts that don't have keyboards on it, but most of it does. So he came up with all new, you know, like, new keyboard parts. And uh, But, like, the intro and stuff like that, we tried to keep it as close to the same, you know, like, uh, certain things we tried to keep really, really close to the original. And then I did all the vocals exactly like, like his vocals. And, I mean, we even went as far as to, like, where panning goes, like left and right, like there's some parts where he just says something on the left or on the right, or it goes left to right or right to left. We even did all that exactly the same. Um, the Satan part near the end, you know, there's a girl doing the like the ghostly vocals. Mm -hmm. We got uh, a friend of mine, Adria, to do the ghostly vocals, you know, and I dubbed in, the, you know, the bells and the gongs and all the church bells and the gongs and everything. So the song, you know, when you put it along the original, it works exactly the same. Exactly the same as the original, but it's still got that after death difference to it. You know, it's got keyboards all the way through, which changes it. And uh, But it's really, really close to the original as far as everything else. In, in that song, what's so, your favorite part of it? You know, at the end, when it's like, are you damned in hell and stuff like that? And it goes fast. Well... Well, I've always loved the Satan part where, you know, where Satan is talking. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just blew me away the first time I heard it. You know, even when I was in Morbid Angel, we used to love that song, you know? And uh, we had a song called Morbid Angel that we never recorded, but it was like, I believe it was about 12 minutes long, you know? So, I mean, uh, you know, that song in particular had a pretty big impact on on the way i, I liked music and things like that uh, that was always my favorite venom track and i just thought it was a masterpiece so uh you know we decided to do it <laughs> and uh it's it's done uh the only thing is we're just uh we've got a little bit more mixing so i'd say it's about 95 percent finished all the recording is done uh, but we've been mixing it with a friend of ours named nick uh goodyear who's in uh that band path of possession mm-hmm he does, he does some, you know, he's uh, really good at editing and mixing and things like that. So he's got a little studio in his house. And uh, we took it, after we did all the recording, uh, we took it to him to mix it. And uh, we worked on it a couple times over there. And probably just one more night we're going to go over there and work on it uh, you know, and have it finished. So I'm not sure when this is going to come out because he's still waiting on some of the other bands, too, to get their songs done. I believe there'll probably be like five bands on the other side, so it'll probably have like six bands on the whole thing. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's something we've been kind of working on off and on for for a little while. It's not a rush situation, you know. When he mentioned it to us, it was just an idea, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, we've kind of like worked on it and then stopped for a while and done other things and then worked on it and stopped for a while. You know, it's been a project in the making for quite a while. But it's really so close to being done now that it's it's pretty much finished, you know. Yeah, the vocals are real similar. Everything's everything's like, you know, the bass has the same effects on it. Uh, we tried to make the song almost exactly like the original, but then we also changed it a little bit, you know, and added keyboards to the whole thing. So it's definitely not 
so close as to people go, oh, well, why, you know, why don't I just listen to the original, you know? Mm-hmm. But it's uh, it's definitely different, but it's it's almost exactly, you know, the same too at the same time. It's like the same song, but from a different dimension. <laughs> T- 2012. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the 2012 version of At War With Satan, so... I think it. I think it's going to be really, really cool when people hear this thing. I mean, I don't think anybody's ever come close to doing a twenty-one and a half minute cover version of any song. Where do you find the extended version? It's not on the album. That one. No, the. Um, I think what happened was back then they didn't know how to extend vinyl any, and I think that they could fit the whole version on one side of vinyl back then when they released it. So they cut out the intro. Uh, so the only real difference is there's an intro to to the beginning. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, not, but it's it's like uh, you know Kronos is talking, you know, like really weird with these like hellish sounds in the beginning. Okay. So it's it's like a, it's like a minute and a half longer than the original. But the only difference is it's just an intro. It's like a spoken word intro. Yeah, yeah. But that thing is such a classic. Uh, what was it that um, there was a something they put out a few years back and it had like some of their I think some of their unreleased songs on it and it had that on it and it had like ads for At War With Satan do you know what I'm talking about? Like uh, the singles or something like that? Yeah it had like singles and then it had like that radio ads Yeah yeah I I got a copy of that You do have that? I actually do yeah Okay well that version of At War With Satan on there is that version Okay I have to look into it I might have heard it and just forgot about it yeah, well, it's, I mean, like I said, it's exactly like the original, but it has an intro on it that's a minute and a half of speaking. Hmm. So that's the only real difference. But we decided to add that onto it, too, to make it like, you know, like the whole song. It completes the song, you know. What is it called? What is that CD called? I can't remember what it's called, but it's got that on there. And it's got the radio ads when At War With Satan came out, the commercials for it. Right. Yeah, so if you have that... That's the one that it's on. And uh, Mike, you are playing any gigs anywhere lately? Um, yeah, like I said, this 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 Saturday, um, in uh, six days, we're playing with Massacre here in Tampa. So that's going to be a really good show, I think. Yeah, we've done about this year. We've done probably five or six shows locally. Uh, we haven't done anything out of town this year, unfortunately. We were. Talking to the, the promoter when we went to Europe back in 2008, we were talking to the promoter uh, that took us there in 2008, and he was talking about taking us there this year again, but we haven't been able to get back in touch with him. He's been out on the road with some other bands. Um, but I don't think it's going to happen this year, but possibly in 2013, I think we're going to probably be able to come back to Europe. Mike Browning, been yeah. a real pleasure talking to you, man. 40 minutes of a great interview here, going to Egypt, great, to music, man. to everything. <laughs> Awesome. Well, you know, like I said, anytime you, you need anything, just let me know. You know, I'm, I'm pretty accessible for, for for people. You know, I'm not a rock star type of person. I'm just, you know, I'm just an average metalhead that, that loves to play music and into the occult and Egyptology. <laughs> well, that's great. That's great for a good conversation as well. Awesome. Awesome. If you ever want to add anything to it or any other questions, just let me know. You know, no problem there. All right. Well, what I'll do is uh, get another interview with you in the future. Okay, yeah, definitely. And Maybe uh, after we release this At War With Satan on vinyl, you know, it's going to go directly to vinyl. So, um, you know, I think uh, that's going to be pretty cool. But like I said, it's probably not even going to make it. By He was going to try to put it out by the end of 2012. Mm-hmm. But I don't, it's not looking like it's going to happen until 2013 now. But um, he, um, the guy from Iron Pegasus put out Primeval, you know, uh, Mantis' uh he put out vinyl for that, so he actually knows Mantis pretty well, and he got his permission to do this, you know, thing. And uh, I think possibly Mantis might even do some comments on on it for everybody. Okay. You know? So it might that might be an official tribute type of thing, you know. So I mean, uh, he started talking to a, to him about doing this, you know, um, before Venom even got back together. You know, and now they're back together and doing shows again. So, um, you know, he's been pretty busy, Mantis, you know. Mm-hmm. He's kind of left his side projects behind. So um, I know they've been really busy lately, Venom, doing a lot of stuff. 
Well, that's great for Venom. Yeah, I know, man. I, I wish I could see them. I'd love to see. That's one band I haven't seen yet that I've always wanted to see live. You know, so hopefully I'll get the chance. <laughs> well, I hope you do. Ven uh, I yeah. interviewed uh, Kronos and uh, Mantis in the past, and uh, they're very good interviews. I'll tell you that. Very good people. Nice. I don't know what they're going to think of our version because it's got keyboards in it. I don't know if they're like keyboard type people, but you know, hope they don't get think it got ruined, you know, putting stuff like that in there. But I mean, I, I think it's very similar to the original. So I mean, I, I would think that they'd probably like it. I think, uh, from what I remember, you know, in my music conversations with them, it, they're very open people in music. You know, they're they're just musicians like anybody else. You know. Right. Right. Yeah, I'd love to play that song live one day, but it's a so hard <laughs> well <laughs> there's so many parts in it but i mean we we took like you know we took everything meticulously when we did that and i mean like the snare drum marking part that like gets louder we even did that i mean everything that you hear on the original is in there plus more so mike excellent yeah, stuff yeah. i gotta let you go because uh, i'm passing my time right. and uh okay it's, it's all cool